Those guys are amazing. VOA Wonder Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Novak. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Here is what is coming up on today's program. Jill Robbins will tell us about the possible expansion of the NATO alliance. Anna Mateo brings us this week's words and their stories. I will return for this weekend's education report. Brian Lynn reports on the effects of the Ukraine war on the Chernobyl nuclear site. Katie Weaver and Dan Friedel will conclude the program with a story on the Great Barrier Reef. But first, here is Jill Robbins. There is growing support in Finland and Sweden for the countries to join the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO. Recent public opinion studies, or polls, showed that citizens in both nations now favor membership in the Western Military Alliance. In Finland, broadcaster YLE carried out its study this week. It found that 53% of citizens, a majority, were in favor of the country joining NATO. About 28% were against it. In Sweden, a poll in late February by broadcaster SVT found that 41% of the public supported NATO membership. 35% opposed it. It was the first time an opinion study in Sweden had found more people in favor of the country joining NATO than were against it. Both nations are seen as important partners for NATO in the Baltic Sea area. Russia has greatly increased its military exercises in the Baltic in the past 10 years. But leaders in the two countries have expressed that they will not be pressured and any decision on NATO membership will be their own. Support for NATO membership rises and falls and currently no clear majority in either nation's parliament approves joining. Some security experts point to the rise in support as a sign that Russia's invasion of Ukraine changed Europe's security situation. The attack on Ukraine led both Finland and Sweden to break with earlier policies not to provide arms to countries at war. Both countries are sending guns and anti-tank weapons to Ukraine. For Sweden, it is the first time it has offered military aid since 1939, when it assisted Finland against the Soviet Union. The unthinkable might start to become thinkable, tweeted former Swedish Prime Minister Karl Bildt. He has supported NATO membership. There are no set requirements for joining NATO. But candidate nations must meet some political and other considerations. Many observers believe Finland and Sweden would qualify for quick entry into NATO without a long negotiation process. Though not members, Finland and Sweden already cooperate with NATO. They permit the alliance's troops to hold exercises on their territory. Finland and Sweden have also intensified their defense cooperation in recent years. Both have secured close military cooperation with the U.S., Britain, and neighboring NATO member Norway. Matte Peso is with the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. He told the Associated Press, the Finnish public has been very consistent in its opinion about NATO membership for the past 30 years. 
It seems now to have changed completely, he said. Russia's foreign ministry voiced concern last week about what it described as efforts by the United States and some of its allies to drag Finland and Sweden into NATO. It warned that Russia would be forced to take measures against the nations if they chose to join the alliance. I'm Jill Robbins. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. On this show, we talk about words and expressions in the English language. Today, we talk about gold. Gold is a highly valued metal. We also use the word gold to describe a person or thing of extreme quality or value. For example, if a friend stood by you in very difficult times, you can say that your friendship is gold to you. Here is another example. If you want to convince someone that they can trust you, you can tell them that your word is gold. That means your word has value, you are honest, and they can trust what you say. In English, the word gold appears in many expressions. Today, we talk about two. One is a compliment, something nice to say about someone or something. The other is an insult, something bad to say about someone or something. Let's start with the insult. That expression is... All that glitters is not gold. First, what does it mean to glitter? To glitter means to shine brightly. Imagine an object that shines by reflecting small flashes of bright light. It is glittering. For example, the diamond glittered in the sunlight. Glitter can also mean to shine with strong emotion. For example, if someone looks very angry, you can say that their eyes glittered in anger. But in today's expression, we are talking about something that looks beautiful because it is so bright and shiny. All that glitters is not gold means something seems wonderful. And beautiful, but in fact is not. You can also move the word not and say it this way Not all that glitters is gold. When we say not all that glitters is gold, we mean that just because something looks attractive does not mean it is valuable. The attractive appearance of something is not a clear sign of its true nature. Another way to say this is, appearances can be deceiving. Now let's hear it used in two examples. I thought that my new computer would be great. And it's not? No, it just cost a lot of money and it looks nice. You know what they say, all that glitters is not gold. Hey, how is the new job going? Well, it's okay. Just okay? Last month you told me it was much better than your current job. More money, better office, and the chance to meet famous people. Well, let's just say... Not all that glitters is gold. The job may pay well, but my co-workers are just awful. I'm really unhappy. Now for the compliment, the nice thing to say about someone. That expression is worth your weight in gold. Imagine if someone made a sculpture of you out of gold. 
it would weigh a lot, and it would be worth a lot of money. And to us, our listeners are worth their weight in gold. The number of book bannings around the country has reached a level not seen for many years. Censorship efforts have happened in places like Florida and Tennessee. One Tennessee school board banned Art Spiegelman's graphic novel about the Holocaust, Mouse. Other states have tried to pass similar measures. There have also been strong reactions from individuals and free speech organizations. Stefana Farrell is a mother of two in Orange County, Florida. At a local school board meeting, some officials criticized Maya Kobabe's graphic novel, Gender Queer: A Memoir. The county decided last autumn to remove it from high schools. Farrell said, "By winter break, we realized this was happening all over the state, and needed to start a project to rally parents to protect access to information and ideas in school." With another Orange County parent, she founded the Florida Freedom to Read project. The group works with other parent groups in the state on a number of educational issues. Farrell said they also work to keep or get back books that have gone under challenge or have been banned. Over the past year, book challenges and bans have reached levels not seen in many years. That information comes from officials at the American Library Association, the National Coalition Against Censorship, or NCAC, and other supporters of free speech. There are some books with pornography and pedophilia that should absolutely be removed from K through 12 school libraries," said Yael Levin. She is a spokesperson for No Left Turn in Education. The nationwide group opposes what it calls a leftist agenda for public schools. Bills have been proposed that restrict classroom reading and discussion around the country, says Pen America. The group works to defend free speech in the U.S. Almost all of the bills, it says, center on sexuality, gender identity, or race. In Missouri. A proposed bill would ban teachers from using the 1619 Project. That is a special project of the New York Times Magazine that centers around slavery in American history. It was released last year as a book. In an answer to such moves, groups like the American Civil Liberties Union, Pen America, and the NCAC have been working with local activists, educators. And families around the country. The head of book publisher Penguin Random House, Marcus Dole, has said he will personally donate five hundred thousand dollars for a book defense fund. Hatchet Book Group has announced emergency donations to Pen, NCAC, and the Authors Guild. In Missouri, the American Civil Liberties Union, or ACLU. Sought action in federal court last month. The organization was hoping to prevent the Wentzville School District from removing books including *Gender Queer*, Toni Morrison's *The Bluest Eye*, and Kiese Lehman's *Heavy*. Fira Eidelman is a lawyer with the ACLU Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project. She said the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in 1982. That local school boards may not remove books from school library shelves simply because they dislike the ideas contained in those books. However, Eidelman said, school officials are permitted to ban books for reasons other than not approving of the ideas in the books. Officials might decide, for example, that the book uses too much vulgar language. But the meaning of vulgarity can change and be unclear," she said, and that can be used by the government to ban books.
On the same day that Russian forces began invading Ukraine, Russian and Ukrainian troops battled for control of the Chernobyl nuclear center. Ukrainian officials said Russian forces won the battle and took control. Chernobyl is the site of the world's most severe nuclear accident. In 1986, a reactor at the nuclear power center exploded and caught fire. The disaster released large amounts of radiation that caused widespread harm to people and other living things in the surrounding area. The site is enclosed within a 2,600 square kilometer restricted area of forest surrounding the former power center, or plant. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said his nation's forces fought to defend Chernobyl so that the tragedy of 1986 will not be repeated. The country's Ministry of Environmental Protection warned of a possible new catastrophe if those controlling the plant did not effectively protect the area. Areas of the plant still contain large amounts of nuclear material in the form of spent fuel and other radioactive waste. Ukrainian officials said last week that radiation levels had increased in areas around the plant after the fighting. The Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, said in a statement that the higher radiation levels could have been caused by soil being moved around by heavy military vehicles entering the area. But it added that the levels it measured remain within the operational range and presented no danger to the public. The IAEA said it was informed on March 2nd that Ukrainian employees had remained at the site since Russian forces took control. Ukrainian officials reported to the IAEA that no operation involving nuclear material had been carried out at Chernobyl since February 24th, the day of Russia's invasion. IAEA Director General Rafael Mariano Grossi said it was extremely important that employees working at the plant are able to do their job safely and effectively. He called for the personal well-being of the workers to be guaranteed by those who have taken control. Russia has not publicly commented on operations at the Chernobyl plant since its forces took control. Several military experts said Russia likely took over the plant because it is on the shortest path from Belarus to Kiev. Belarus is an ally of Russia and was a launching point for Russian ground troops. It was the quickest way from A to B, James Acton told Reuters. He is with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace Policy Center in Washington, D.C. Edwin Lyman is the Director of Nuclear Power Safety at the U.S.-based Union of Concerned Scientists. He told the Associated Press, I can't imagine how it would be in Russia's interest to allow any facilities at Chernobyl to be damaged. Lyman was most worried about spent nuclear fuel stored there. He said if the power to cooling equipment is cut off or fuel storage tanks are damaged, the results could be disastrous.
Germany's vice chancellor and economy minister Robert Habeck told the AP that Russia would not need to take nuclear material from Chernobyl because it already has large supplies of its own. Carmel Mothersill is a professor and the Canada Research Chair in Environmental Radiobiology at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. In an article for The Conversation, she expresses concerns about how the war in Ukraine might affect future research on radioactivity and wildlife in areas around Chernobyl. Some studies have found that many forms of wildlife have thrived in the human-free environment around the plant. These include bears, bison, wolves, lynxes, wild horses, and many species of birds. But other studies suggest the effects of radiation have caused problems across different species. I'm Brian Lynn. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, is warning that the life of the Great Barrier Reef is in serious danger. The IPCC released its sixth major report on the health of the planet Monday. It said, if Pacific Ocean temperatures continue to rise, bleaching will kill the remaining corals that make up Australia's Great Barrier Reef. Bleaching is the result of higher than normal ocean temperatures. Warmer water causes corals to release the plants that feed them and make them colorful. They turn white and sicken, often dying very quickly. The report predicts the warming will continue and bleaching events will happen more often. The Great Barrier Reef is the largest living structure on Earth. The reef is over 2,300 kilometers long. It is home to thousands of kinds of fish and other animals. Giant clams, whales, dolphins, and birds are among the others that depend on the reef to live. Humanity also profits from the reef. It is very popular with visitors, who bring a lot of money to the area. Before the start of the COVID-19 crisis, reef tourism was worth $4.6 billion yearly to the Australian economy. The industry also supported over 60,000 jobs. The reef was the center of Tony Fontes's 40-year career. The professional diver taught the sport and led dive trips to the reef. Fontes said he has seen the reef after a bleaching event. He described the water turning white from the floating remains of dead corals. He compared the destruction to that from a forest fire. You just realize you've just swum across a reef that a couple weeks ago was full of life and vibrant, and now a bushfire has gone through it, and the coral is dead, he said, adding, and the rest of the marine life will just have to move on or die off. Ava Shearer also got a close look at a bleaching when she swam at the reef two years ago. The sight made her cry. The reef used to look like a busy capital city, she said, but that day it was empty. 
the now 17-year-old Shearer, is a Sea Life student at nearby James Cook University. She is worried about the reef's future. I fear there might not be anything for me to study, she said. In 2016, the Great Barrier Reef had its worst bleaching on record. Over 90% of the reef was sickened. The IPCC says the northern and middle parts of the reef were hit hard by a series of bleachings that followed. The report described the reef there to be in a highly degraded state. That bleaching will continue along the reef is almost certain, the IPCC says in the report. In fact, the report suggests it may simply be too late to stop bleaching completely. Even if the world is able to meet an international goal on temperature reduction, bleaching events will still take place, the IPCC found. The IPCC says warming ocean water will hurt reefs around the world and reports that there have been mass deaths of some coral species. It will not be easy for Australia to reduce its effect on the world environment, however. The nation's economy depends on exports of coal and natural gas. It also burns coal for power. Even with warnings about the state of the reef and its economic importance, the nation has not been moving fast on such issues. Climate action is a difficult subject in Australia, one of the world's biggest exporters of coal and natural gas. The Australian government said recently it would provide $1 billion to help the reef. Critics said that alone will not keep ocean temperatures from going up. The IPCC report noted that if the bleaching continues, Australia's economy will lose almost $1 billion and 10,000 jobs per year from reduced tourism. Scott Heron is a physics professor and a reef science expert at James Cook. He said one billion people in the world depend on healthy reefs to make a living. If the world does not work to slow climate change, there could be serious problems for humans, he said. It's going to affect real people and real people's lives, he said. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Dan Friedel. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Dan Novak.